Hi all, today I would like to talk a little more about the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. It's really a big chapter that I <laughs> talk about with, with great pleasure. Most of all because I, I got the impression, I don't know if, if I was wrong about it, that in, in popular you know, culture, in popular imagination, this Norman Kingdom of Sicily doesn't, doesn't really exist. I met even people with who, uh, who s s consider themselves as um, experts and, and passion about Norman history, um, and they knew everything about from from the Viking Age to you know the Norman Kingdom of Sicily uh, of, of England, but we had never heard even about Norman Kingdom of Sicily. They said, "Oh wow!" But did did the Normans even go that that south? <laughs> far south yes they did and not only that by the way and um, <clears throat> and therefore I, I would like to 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 spread a bit more of awareness about this kingdom and especially in its um, you know uh, political and and strategical importance because uh, the majority of, of of data that I've read being shared and um, and that interests people is is mainly you know um, relatively to to Norman uh, to Siculo Norman art so this very um, beautiful combination of um, artistical elements from various cultural traditions that made up uh, this uh, multi-ethnic um, uh, kingdom in the Mediterranean but um, as a matter of fact the, the Kingdom of Sicily is of extreme importance especially from uh, a political and especially an institutional point of view, um, something about which uh, I will surely dedicate a topic on on its own, since um, I just premised that the, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily was the the uh, most centralized kingdom uh, in um, of the High Middle Ages, hmm? uh, in in at least in the Latin Germanic world. Um, and um, it had a huge importance. As a matter of fact, it was even more powerful than than, than the Norman Kingdom of England. Um, and it didn't obviously extend just on 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 the Sicilian island, but as you can see from the map that I've that I've prepared in here, um, <coughs> it stretched to other various uh, Mediterranean um, lands, including. Uh, you know the the Near East and, and North Africa, um, and as you can see from here, the um, uh, the 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 Norman Kingdom of Sicily was quite deeply involved into the whole um, <coughs> strategic scenario of the Mediterranean, which was quite quite fluid, by the way. And uh, the objective, um, you know, of my video today is to you know make a little. A little game that uh, I don't know how much it will be funny for you, but I, I think it's fascinating. That is uh, essentially uh, trying to, you know, to embody a um, uh, Norman, a uh, secular Norman king of the 12th century. So the moment of um, major um, political relevance of of of. Um, of of the, of Norman Sicily, and to um, to observe the faces, uh, observe the um, excuse me the um, you know the challenges that you had to face, uh, both internally and externally in the kingdom. And I I picked up the Norman Kingdom of Sicily essentially because it was a, a pretty unitary, um, um, you know, um, it was a pretty strong statal entity at that time. So it's a kind of the prototype of the new, uh, fresh and, and powerful political entity that has uh, huge ambitions and that is on the rise to um, <laughs> to practically show how, you know, um, the, uh, the statal um, systems of, of, the, of the Middle Ages weren't um, in spite of their relative power for the, for their own times, actually quite difficult um, systems to manage, and that um, 
and which were the the main uh, the main difficulties in ruling um, a kingdom of, of this kind. So um, the first thing you have to think about um, is obviously having an internal equilibrium first, uh, then you know venturing in a, in, a, in any um, <coughs> um, you know oversee adventure uh, in, in the Mediterranean. And um, and the organization of the uh, Sicola Norman domains was was very peculiar. Um, it had basically originated as um, as a very um, um, uh, varied um, um, and and different and diverse uh, group of um, set of of, of domains. Um, that uh, that in fact even at at the time of the formal unification of the kingdom in 1130, although you know the the Norman dominion existed since 80 years, um, it still had um, a rather low uh, political and administ administrative cohesion, and um, and 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 it was inhabited by. Uh, communities with very different religious and, and um, linguistical and cultural backgrounds. Um, the, um, uh, the the Sicilian territories, as you know, had belonged to the um, the Muslim Emirate of Sicily, which had progressively been conquered by the Normans in the second half of the 11th century, um, thanks to to you know the papal support. And the promise of you know making of Sicily uh, um, essentially a uh, um, uh, obviously this this uh, legitimated dominion of the Normans, um, and uh, but it still comprehended and uh, Sicily was obviously the the most important land uh, first of all because it was a, a extremely fertile. Uh, considered that the grain coming from Sicily was exported. Uh, in, in various uh, regions of Europe and the Mediterranean, it fed a large part of the of, of the Italian um, of the Italian mainland. Even in the center and the north, it was exported um, everywhere. So <laughs> it was an extremely rich territory. And since um, the um, the the main you know um, economical uh, wealth of that time came from agricultural um, resources, having this very Big, fertile, fat land of Sicily was definitely, um, you know, a very good place to start from. But uh, as you see from the map here, um, the the kingdom of Sicily um, in um, comprehended also great part of the Italian, um, actually the whole southern uh, southern Italy. And and here it's not properly displayed, but there were also s certain parts of central Italy. Especially on the Adriatic Sea, that were that came uh, to be uh, in the hands of the Normans. Now these lands um, had essentially two um, two different backgrounds: either Longobard or Byzantine. Um, the the Apenninic area was strongly. Um, uh, first of all, it had a more uh, Italic background than the coasts. The coasts in southern Italy had always been um, quite influenced by. Uh, by the Greeks during the early Middle Ages, actually the Italic uh, societies, uh, communities, um, in, in parallel with the decline of the cities of the ancient world, had expanded even uh, from from the country. But uh, <clears throat> you can argue that um, essentially, even for in terms of political and social and juridical organization, the the Apennine that you can see here roughly you know, in the reliefs that goes from <coughs> from here in Norman dominions from uh, the north of Naples up to um, the, the Strait of Messina um, was inhabited by um, by communities of Longbird tradition that uh, especially in around Naples had a very strong uh, cultural identity. They were still very proud. Um, uh, these had hosted the uh, Langobard prince doms that had survived the Carolingian conquest of the kingdom in the north. And uh, and were by the way these um, um, Langobard prince doms that had first hired uh, Norman mercenaries mm, in the area to wage their wars and that eventually got conquered by their same. Uh, mercenaries. By the way, the Normans had risen 
you know, as uh, initially in very modest ways, you know, they, they they went to southern Italy as contractors, essentially to to escort the uh, the pilgrims to the Near East, to the Holy Land, and uh, and eventually had you know uh, had had looked themselves around and uh, and decided that you know the, the local political situation was favorable for them to maybe form their own lordship um, uh, in, into into southern Italy, which they managed uh, to do. Um, and eventually uh, bringing a lot of other um, uh, fellows from Normandy, uh, especially once that Sicily uh, was uh, was conquered, or during the same conquest of the island. But the first steps had been taken uh, into the, uh, the peninsular domains. Um, <clears throat> the coastal areas instead were uh, mostly um, Greek influenced, uh, there were a lot of of of, of cities in in, in the um, on the Italian coast uh, coast um, in the south as much as uh, in the north, actually, um, and, um, and and were very uh, very powerful um, um, sea um, re maritime republics, um, and some of the most uh, some of the most ancient ones. And it's very interesting to see how the Norman conquest progressively choked their expansion because the Normans had imported from France essentially a feudal system. Um, and in spite of it was a bit diverse, and we'll be seeing it in, in a short while, um, had basically, um, uh, you know, um, stamped the expansion of these coastal cities that eventually declined and weren't uh, of much help. Um, and, and these uh, cities had uh, usually grown as Byzantine cities because the Byzantines during the early Middle Ages had very strong contacts with all um, coastal Italy that was at large in fact retained as imperial domains in single cities while the interland was populated by by the Longobards. Um, <coughs> who were instead a mainly terrestrial power and developed into the, the Italic um, uh, mainland essentially um, <coughs> and um, in another very important land of this if, if you look um, especially from from the map here you can see how the, the western side of southern Italy is rather um, it has a lot of mountains uh, the Apennines and uh, instead there is um, a very f a flat land that is actually a plateau that is um, um, on the heel of the boot and, 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 and up to north, that is Apulia. Mm -hmm. So this land was extremely fertile and it's not a surprise that Normans, um, you know, besides Sicily, settled their own barons mostly and had their most direct control on the Apulian lands because they were extremely fertile as well as strategically very important also because they were close <coughs> to the to the Byzantine Empire in the Balkans and uh, the Strait of Brindisi was um, a very important trade route from which the, the Venetians especially um, through which the Venetians passed to go into the Ionian Sea and eventually to towards Constantinople. Um, so this was, this was a very diverse area and, and especially um, you can't imagine even the differences in managing to, to reach certain territories because by sea through the coast you can reach quite easily and quite fast a lot of places but in the Apennine interland you have to you know struggle to to get with the logistics of those times and the resources of those times uh, into into the mountain valleys etc those were the same the same mountains in which to which the Samnites gave so much trouble to the uh, Roman legions back in the day. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, obviously, um, uh, it was a, in, indeed a, a, um, a mosaic of different um, traditions and cultures, considered that um, uh, th there was also a very different religious background in many ways because um, the Muslims in Sicily, um, you know, during Norman conquest, the, most of the Muslims emigrated back to Tunisia from, from which they had come from originally, yet there were certain Muslim communities inhabiting the island yet, so you had these Muslim communities in Sicily. Um, <clears throat> but there were also very important uh, Jewish communities, especially in the uh, in the coastal cities, Naples had a very strong Jewish community. 
um, they were traders usually, and they 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 contributed on their own in the development of the novel Italian, um, uh, you know, um, trade um, capabilities. But within the same Christianity, were differences too, because here, uh, you know, uh, the Roman Catholicism and and Greek Orthodoxy weren't really. Uh, officially split, but obviously were very different local traditions and and uh, you know think about liturgies, think about the different languages, and uh, and therefore you know the, the communities like the Longobard one were Roman Catholic, um, while the the Greek influenced areas, especially in Sicily and 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 in Apulia, um, had very important. Uh, especially uh, very important in, in very important very powerful um, monastic centers of Greek tradition that weren't just religious centers but also very important political and economical centers because they had a freaking huge amount of land um, and um, and a lot of communities gravitated around these um, these structures so I, I'm trying to give you the, the idea of how diverse, um, you know, this the the, the 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 social fabric was. This could be, you know, a double-edged sword because you could play on the differences to to you know, to make, <coughs> I mean, to win some communities um, fealty to the crown, uh, but at the same time, you know, obviously, you know, it's still better to have an homogeneous uh, land to conquer to to rule if you. Uh, if you especially require, you know, a common political action of all the components of, of society, and um, and um, and generally speaking, the, the Roman, uh, excuse me, the Normans had um, <coughs> had been quite tolerant for that time towards the various uh, religious and as well as juridical traditions. Um, you know, the idea of tolerance in the Middle Ages is a bit different from the one we have today. You know, uh, the tolerance we 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 think um, usually uh, about as moderns is the one that you know, politically and phi- phi- philosophically and juridically is developed in 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 the 17th century in Western Europe. Um, the tolerance in in medieval for medieval standards was um, essentially the coexistence of certain communities that could be you know um, <coughs> sanctioned and favored by um, by the local rulers as the Normans was, but was never you know uh, fully you know sanctioned. I mean um, even Norman Sicily that was quite tolerant, multi ethnic. Uh, multi-ethnical for the time, still so very brutal slaughters of certain communities, especially the Muslims, uh, who weren't, you know, the saints either. You know, there was a lot of uh, brigandage, for for example, in the, the Sicilian countryside of these bands of uh, that, that we call Muslims, but you know, they, they were probably quite mixed, and and therefore, you know, these these bands could could oscillate really, you know, but. Uh, but it was still pretty useful, also because um, all these various communities had a, their own specialization. You know, you you couldn't see the beautiful mosaics in the cathedral of Palermo if there hadn't been um, Arab artisans there, Arab craftsmen. Uh, you know, um, <coughs> the middle classes were extremely important. Um, uh, the, the were people who were were quite highly literate in 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 Sicily and southern Italy for, for those time standards, um, and as we will be seeing, there would be various influences that the Normans uh, were able to exploit at their advantage in in ruling in ruling the kingdom, and and the juridical differences were very, quite important as well because, for instance, the um, well, the the Arabs had surely their own uh, Islamic right, so they they kind of had their own tradition that influences you know the way you you have to manage justice, etc. Uh, the Longobards of Peninsular Italy had um, their own Longobard law. Um, the Byzantine areas, um, the Byzantine influenced areas, definitely had this the the, the ancient Roman law, and at least transformed into the the local. Um, you know the local traditions and and, and practices, um, so that is also important because if you have to administer justice, you have to deal with all these uh, these problems, and 
it was a very um mm, you know a very different uh way you could plan this you could impose so but usually you know there was much tolerance um by already by use i mean independently from what rulers said i mean you could you could be you know a long bird an arab a greek or an italian um uh, of other origin but you could uh, most of the times at least you could choose um uh, under which right you you had to be judged and that that is very interesting because it, it proves that the people were uh, at that time uh, able to and in that society able to 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 understand law um <coughs> to to use it to, uh, to, un to understand it to read it to to put it in practice in trade and um, in juridical matters, and that tells you how you know lively actually this uh, southern uh, Italian society was into the uh, secular Norman kingdom, um, and um, and it's exactly from these local traditions that, um, especially from the Arab and and Byzantine one, that the Normans. Um, uh, created um, and in certain times maintained, even from previous structures, a very efficient um, um, administrative and bureaucratic apparatus. Um, the Byzantines and 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 the Arabs, um, and the Arabs, uh, in the imitation of the Byzantines, te technically um, had um, built uh, usually centralized uh, states. So, if you look, for instance, at Spain, Muslim Spain. Uh, the Emirate of Cordoba, or, or if you take the Byzantine Empire, which is the most obvious example, these were centralized states with a bureaucratic apparatus, with something that went that was quite different from the um, you know the, the rest of of um, uh, of European tradition or legal tradition that was at least in continental Europe largely uh, Frankish. And it's interesting because also the, Rom uh, the Normans, as Frenchmen, uh, had essentially a, a, a feudal uh, Frankish, Frankish uh, feudal um, tradition, also in legal matters. Um, and this is also one of the most important elements that you have to look at when, if, if you, if you want to think at how the Normans practically ruled, and how they achieved so much into Sicily, because they were able to create two um, different systems um, coexisting uh, one within the other that allowed the central authority to to be um, to be actually stronger um, <coughs> because from one side um, the um, the um, here we have seen there is a centralized state in some measure um, especially the the exercise of governmental power were entrusted to a body of functionaries that were um, were royal functionaries present uh, scattered all over the territory and would dependent uh, were dependent directly from the court of Palermo so they had it, they had the uh, direct contact with the Norman kings um, and these were the um, justiciaries and the camerari, who were respectively, um, uh, you know, um, in charge of the, um, the the justice administration and the the fiscal administration and of uh, the uh, the royal incomes. And that that is quite important because you need a bit of you know a bit of of coins to to uh, you know to rule such a big thing like the kingdom of uh, of Sicily. And um, but there were also other uh, offices like uh, especially for functioning for bettering the um, the functioning of these apparatus. There were um uh, financial offices um that were instituted by the Normans were called the dohane in Latin, which however is, is not a Latin uh term because it's the Latinization of an Arab term, um which in fact um Normans took from the previous Muslim administration that uh, was preposed to the um, to the management of the incomes of the um, of the stadal estates. I mean those um, those lands that didn't belong to anyone but to.
the king. Even though the Doane um, were also in charge of, you know, controlling and managing the the exaction of those um, rights of uh, seigneurial nature that came from the fact that the Kingdom of Sicily, in spite of this centralized apparatus, still was a feudal kingdom. So this is quite important because <coughs> because in parallel to these um, um, centralized state, you still have feudal uh, lords that were essentially Norman barons that had been settled into the various uh, southern Italian lands, um, and that obviously were there because the Normans were some of the, um, you know, the Normans when they settled into Normandy were like a sponge to everything that was French surrounding them, and they were um, very strongly feudalized. I mean, the, the, the Normans brought everything from France, including uh, feudalism, but they were they were smart enough to build. Um, first of all, something from scratch, like the, that kingdom had, so a very good opportunity. Um, and and to you know to replicate French feudalism, but um, checking the power of feudal lords that in France were you know even more powerful than um, than the king. <laughs> and just think about that the same Normans of England were technically vassals of the French king as, 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 as dukes of Normandy, but they had a kingdom of their own in Britain. So the Normans were, were really um, you know, <laughs> aware of how these political games functioned. Um, so the, the building of, of a centralized administration um, in parallel to, to a feudal one was an extremely smart uh, move in order to preserve a, a direct control over the wall territory, which instead in feudal Europe was something very difficult to achieve, and at the same time maintaining the, uh, you know, the, 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 the military advantage deriving from having a feudal society and therefore being able to, to rise uh, a feudal uh, feudal levies and, and especially heavy cavalry for which the Normans as Frenchmen were, were so uh, famous for. Uh, and it and, and, and the dwarf uh, very successfully exported into um, into southern Italy, although we must mention that even if the Normans didn't like to admit it because they were very proud about their being knights and calormen and nobles, etc., uh, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily still uh, had a very large uh, local levy of, um, of Italian uh, city militias that up to a certain point before the, the city's decade was, was actually pretty uh, pretty tough, very, very important for the Normans, also because for fighting the rebels in the Apennines, uh, as it often happened, you know, you need a lot of infantrymen, even to, to carry on sieges, and and even the same Norman conquest of Sicily had seen, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, conquering of uh, every little castle one by one, because fortunately the Arab society was divided, didn't know feudalism. Um, you know, the Normans brought, together with their own heavy cavalry, um, a lot of Italian infantrymen from the um, from Peninsular Italy and and those elements would be um, very very important even if there were ideological prejudices of uh, the mounted uh, knightly elite uh, towards everyone who, who fought on foot and who wasn't noble as a matter of fact even if the Normans knew how to fight on 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 foot as well as the major you know all the 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 European knights uh, at that time, in spite of their being eminently uh, trained as cavalrymen. Um, and um, however, um, throughout um, Norman, um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty pink picture that <laughs> we have drawn here. But uh, you know, this was the effort of a centralization of the Norman kingdom wasn't that, um, you know, it was successful in part, but obviously, you know, um, it couldn't really solve those, those problems coming from uh, the weakness of the statual constitution with, uh, over such a disomogeneous um, cultural background. And especially because, um, as in any other uh, local, you know, I, I'm any other 
kingdom um, in uh, in Europe at that time, there were a lot of rebellions, especially from the local barons, or from communities like I like to to remember the Longobard communities because being placed in the Apennines where they were quite um, Apennines where they were quite um, difficult to catch in many ways, and they, you know, it, the whole Sicil Norman kingdom was mainly conceived as the uh, Norman Sicily ruling over Peninsular Italy from the Peninsular perspectives. In fact, you know, the, the Normans were, were, you know, the, the, the Norman court was in Palermo, so Sicily was the center at that point. He said the, the Angevins would, for instance, shift the power to Naples even before they, they lost Sicily to the Aragonese eventually. Um, so it, w it was obvious that there would be um, local um, local troubles, and and uh, and it wasn't just local uh, non-Norman communities who would create problems. Because first of all, this, the society at that point was quite mixed. There were a lot of barons who also came from local Italic um, aristocracy, but um, there were certain Norman. Um, Norman um, lords, Norman barons, that uh, really played, you know, a bit sneakily, uh, and especially the ones in, in Apulia. Now, as I said before, Apulia was this extremely fertile land, there is a very strong Norman um, legacy in Apulia still today, but uh, this area, if you look at it from the map, it's exactly, you know, diametrically opposed to Sicily within the the Siculo Norman um, dominions, and uh, as was remembered also before, it's extremely close to the Byzantine Empire, to to the Balkans, to to modern day Albania. Um, and the Byzantines actually <laughs> um, uh, wanted to take, as we will be seeing, the 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 parts of Italy, if not the whole Italian mainland, back at a point, and uh, and they would play on these local Norman lords. So it could happen quite easily that if the Byzantines sent an expedition in an Apulian land, they could win over with their money um, the local, you know, Norman barons and um, and create many problems for the um, from the Oatville dynasty from Sicily to to respond effectively to that threat. Fortunately for well, no, I can't say that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> just wait. Um, um, and um, so, um, especially after Roger II, who was, you know, the first king of Sicily proper, uh, Sicily uh, up to 1130 was a county. Uh, as such, it was entrusted to the Normans um, by the Pope, even before um, Sicily had been conquer conquered from, from the Muslims. Uh, and um, and um, and really, um, after you know, he he was the main guy who was able to recover all the lands uh, from Peninsular Italy and to you know give a certain stability to the whole system. But uh, during his successors, who were called uh, both William, William the first, <coughs> eleven four, who ruled from as king of Sicily from eleven uh, fifty four to eleven sixty six, and William the second, ruled um, in, from eleven sixty six to eleven eighty nine. Um, there were also many problems. That um, you know, first of all, after the death of Roger, um, there were rebellions. This is also interesting. That if you want to consider conceive, you know, how to rule uh, a medieval kingdom, that uh, uh, when you die, if, especially if your um, sons are mm, are minors, and uh, you know, the, 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 there is a immediately a gap of a vacuum of power, and in this vacuum, obviously, the rebels can can expand and create problem from. Uh, for a centralized dominion. Um, so uh, William I and II were, you know, um, um, engaged into these problems and in recovering um, the lands, rebelling, uh, with, with a lot of effort, you know, this is a moment in history in which w when you wage a war, you, you don't just say, uh, you don't have li uh, limitless uh, resources, you know, in, in order to wage a, a big serious long campaign you you can't basically forget to to wedge another one in the same generation because the 
uh, you know, the rate crops, uh, you know, at this point wouldn't really allow you to have enough resources to carry to carry it on. So think how slow um, and and why it was, you know, medieval advancement was so slow. And telling the truth, at that time and for those means, it was extremely fast. So especially in a kingdom like the one of Sicily, it was pretty unitary. You know, it was easier to put big thing in motion, motion but still, you know, um, it would take a freaking lot of time and it, it would be very costly. Um, but now I would like to focus, telling the truth, on the external side. Now that we gave a picture of the wall, you know, uh, you know, very schematic, at least in, um, um, uh, um, picture, yeah, that's the word, of of internal affairs. Now, uh, first of all, um, as you read from the title, we are talking about land, and as you can see obviously from the map that I placed a puzzle over this, it's a land, the, Nor the Sicilian Norman Kingdom is something that is in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, from a strategic point of view, this is freaking amazing because very few kingdoms would have such an opportunity. But at the same time, it was also uh, the Mediterranean was a very, um, very tough and um, an unstable system with a lot of threats coming from other very competitive um, rivals. Now, it's very interesting um, that you, if you consider here, you look at the the blue that 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 shows the 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 Norman dominions uh, to watch the uh, modern uh, Tunisian and and um, and Libyan uh, coast as part of the Norman domains because during the 12th century um, the Normans were able to ex uh, to expand expand their protectorate over um, the uh, over those regions um, the the Tunisia and Libya would be ruled at that time by uh, local Muslim dynasties but um, differently from S Muslim Spain and uh, or Muslim Egypt um, uh, these were quite weaker domains than uh, you know they weren't really s very heavily centralized state there was a very high degree of fragmentation and the Sicilian powers w w was so great especially as we said for also for commercial reasons, think about all the grain. The grain was exported to Africa as well at this point. Uh, these local coastal areas of North Africa were dependent from the Normans, so it's very difficult to assess and practice you know, the degree of uh, intervention of the Sicilian um, in, in this area during the Norman times, but there was definitely a great um, trade, uh, penetration, commercial penetration, and definitely also military um, influence exercise there. Then if you look at the Near East, when you read um, here it's a German map, it's called Antiochia. Um, so this is uh, this is a Norman land as well because it's uh, the principality of Antioch as a matter of fact. Now the Principate of Antioch, as I, I presume most of you medieval history lovers know, uh, was one of the uh, major a crusader states formed uh, during the first crusade, so it was one of the, those first rank powers, <coughs> crusade uh, powers uh, of Haute-Mer. Um, and it was in a Norman dominion because it, it had been uh, conquered by Bohemond of uh, Taranto, so Bohemond of Hauteville, um, who was in fact um, uh, part of the uh, Sicilian Norman dynasty. And therefore, the Normans had this, um, you know, um, uh, essentially these this, this enclave of their own into the uh, into the Near East, uh, together with the other Crusading states. Now, consider, look at the map. You know, between them, you you have here. It's not colored, but uh, you know, you can spot obviously the Byzantine Empire with today's roughly today's Greece and Turkey. Uh, so it's it's very very important to find uh, this presence there because it, it's it's exactly um, you know between uh, you know between Sicily and the Near East. So all the trade routes that especially the Italian Marat maritime republics um, crossed ostensibly was essentially this link. Uh, and 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 considering that the Normans were quite hostile with the Byzantines, who could understand how the Byzantines were worried of the 
of the Normans expanding at that point in this uh, excuse me, I made one thing fall on the, on the table, on the desk. Um, and um, uh, how worried of, of, of the Norman um, expansion? As a matter of fact, here it's not shown, but uh, in, uh, in, the, in the 80s of the 11th century, the Normans had invaded Epirus, uh, that is modern-day uh, Albania, uh, which was a Byzantine dominion, uh, hoping to reach for Constantinople. And once again, um, in, if I'm not wrong, in the 30s of the 12th century, so in the time where we're focusing on, they had taken um, and, and burned down um, Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica is a city here on the um, Greek coast of the Aegean Sea. It's not, it's not marked on the map. It was essentially after Constantinople, the second, uh, actually the, the, the only other big um, city proper of, of the Byzantine Empire. It was a very important commercial uh, area, sometimes quite sneaky as well towards Constantinople, because you don't think that the Byzantine Empire was extremely compact in spite of the, its institutional um, you know, uh, asset and status centralization. So it's interesting how, you know, at, at a local level, these powers could play um, very dirty uh, against each other by making parts of the respective uh, rivals rising. Uh, but it's just to say that uh, that it was um, um, a natural in an ambition and an, an obvious strategical goal for the Normans to take the golden apple proper that is Constantinople. The, Norma the, the Normans um, never actually got close to to take Constantinople, but it was still, you know, a, a goal that it could that it could achieve. Uh, but now that we've seen, you know, the major aggressive options for for a Norman, uh, secular Norman ruler, um, let's see how you know where actually the the the, the audience is. You know, in the sense that uh, there were also many problems that the Normans had to face, uh, strategically speaking. Um, you might think the major problem uh, was constituted by, you know, big guys like the Byzantine Empire, as a matter of fact, or maybe the, the, the Sultanate of Egypt was also a pretty powerful entity, but actually the, the main um, the main problems for, for the Normans in this sense came from the Italian um, maritime city-states because they were extremely useful and dangerous at the same time for the Normans. Especially Genoa and Venice uh, were on the rise in this moment. Pisa was also a very powerful um, maritime republic. And the great problem, um, you know, you know, th these were essentially merchant republics, you know, and, and they all they cared about was to make a lot of money. They didn't care much about expanding to the internland, usually. Just Pisa maybe did at this point, because they well, all they cared about was to to take um, you know uh, several ports and to control of those ports as as marketplaces, and to play in that. Um, but the and, and therefore nobody liked <laughs> the Italian maritime republics because they were greedy and they only want money for their own. But it were um, extremely um, flattered for one thing that every big um, you know Mediterranean power uh, craved for what was it a fleet uh, this is a moment in in, 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 in naval affairs in medieval history in which there, there is no thing like um, a permanent professional fleet um, the only such thing was had been better in Constantinople but even Constantinople up to this time had essentially a Venetian fleet so what was the deal the deal was you know that putting up a fleet was an extremely costly affair. Uh, the Italians did it for free because they armed galleys in in a fashion that even if they didn't have a permanent fleet themselves, they had the capability of uh, of creating tens and tens of of, ga of galleys um, in 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 a few months. Um, and and even for the the, the city state, it was extremely easy to confiscate certain um, galleys, uh, maybe that you know, merchant galleys for, for using it for military purpose. 
consider that there is not a great difference in here. The convoys that uh, traveled uh, across the Mediterranean were normally um, like in, in the Viking Age. It's a weird comparison, but it's essentially the same thing conceptually. You know, the idea that it's, that it's both um, a military and a, a, a commercial force at, at the same time. There are certain galleys that are armed for war and there are um, uh, in the same convoy and, and are in galleys that are um, uh, that carry goods. And uh, it wasn't just an uh, uh, um, yeah, defensive purpose in the sense that obviously you, you need military escort to the goods you're trading and which you make money. But it was also an offensive one because in in, in the various Mediterranean ports uh, that the Italians traveled, uh, it, it it often happened that uh, I don't know that the Venetians and Genoese would would make a mess and even <laughs> set the old city on fire because they they were fighting against each other for uh, the um, you know the hegemony over, over that over that port over that scale, um, and. Um, and in this picture, you know, uh, for for if you were an Oathville, you, you you wouldn't think really about arming your own cities because, as we have seen, the Normans were trying to to crush the 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 local resistances of of, of coastal cities, uh, for which uh, southern Italy won't have the the naval the same naval development of of the, of the central and northern Italian um, coastal cities. Um, so it, it could be profitable to have within your kingdom certain cities producing galleys, but at the same time this would correspond to their aggressiveness. It's as if you you know you had a snake in your own chest <laughs> growing. So the easiest thing that you could do, you know, especially when you, you you actually needed a fleet, because you wouldn't normally need a fleet if you didn't have anyone to to invade or to or nowhere to go. Usually, crusaders would travel on uh, on these Italian ships uh, most of the times. So they were armed by the Italians for the crusaders uh, in exchange of money, of course. Um, but it was easier, you know, to say, I don't know, Genoa. Um, you know, uh, just imagine uh, the guy from um, the Oathville guy, the king of Sicily from Palermo, phoning <laughs> a Genoa and hello, Genoa, how are you doing? You know, wh why don't you land us? I don't know. 20 galleys for this military expedition, and Genoa said, okay, uh, we make you this prize, and then they say, oh, okay, well, I agree, and, and this this is how it basically worked. So these, um, the Kingdom of Sicily basically grew, um, it's now a power through, especially the Genoese power, actually the Venetians were, there was this, uh, this dichotomy that shouldn't be excessively stressed because the, the, the factors involved are very you know, variable, but uh, it was essentially um, the Norman, uh, uh, the Cyclo Normans with Genoa and the Byzantines with Venice. Also, because as we were saying before, with the Strait of Brindisi, uh, the Normans could easily uh, cut out the Venetian trade routes uh, towards the east, where they were making a hell of a, a, a big money, um, and therefore the Venetians were always worried by a strong Sicily because they 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 feared that they could be choked uh, into the Adriatic, and they often played against the Sicilians and the, the Byzantine expeditions into into uh, southern Italy and Norman lands were often led by. Uh, Venetian, uh, Venetian galleys. The, the Byzantines had been masters of the Mediterranean as a naval power for centuries and centuries, but at this time, in the 12th century, the Italians basically, and therefore the West, basically surpass the Byzantines, both for the quality of of um, of the sailors, uh, for the naval technology, and, and and even sheer you know um, sheer economical power. Um, so uh, what happens in here is that um, you you normally play uh, on the rivalries between the Italian maritime uh, city states to gain galleys to to wage your own affairs, but the problem is that you're still reliant on on on, a, on an external entity. So if in that moment I don't know Genoa has problems on its own because maybe he, she wants to be allied with the German emperors and and not with you, well at that point you can't play, you can't have the Genoese ships, and that is a problem. So uh, you're dependent on that. Without mentioning that the Italians, if they get angry, <laughs> which stereotypically seems to be the case quite often. Um, 
I'm joking, of course. Um, uh, they could, uh, they have their naval power, so and you don't. So if they want to raid your own coasts and pillaging and ta and you know inflicting you a very heavy damage, they can do that quite effectively. So um, that's that's a, a a point of weakness that you have you really have to consider, and 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 a thing you are basically uh, dependent by. On the other hand, obviously there is always the idea that also the Italians have to make money some way, so being enemy with everyone is not a, definitely a good um, you know, economical strategy, and especially if you had territories in, in, in the, in the uh, Near East, like it was in the Norman case, uh, the Italians uh, would be happy to, to use your own ports, um, so you could choose to whom to entrust these these ports. Obviously the Italian communities would form basically cities within the the coastal cities on their own. Um, um and uh and operate from there the main uh, economical things. And and uh, by the way that's very important because normally the um Crusader states were being shortage of of material of material in, in, in into into the Near East and the Italians provided them with with such things. So, you know, for trading at least um these um uh, maritime republics were were quite useful. Um however um there was also another problem for the Normans as as Christians and, you know, being broadly part of the you know, obviously the Christian bloc, even if this is a moment really in which everybody played independently from religion. The Byzantines sometimes allied with the Muslims, the Crusaders did the same, you know. Uh, it wasn't much of a, uh, of a problem. But let's say that in big, you know, terms, you know, when you have uh, half of the Mediterranean Islamic and half the other half Christian, uh, there is certain attrition, and um, the Kingdom of Sicily sta lays in the very center of the Mediterranean. And the problem for the Normans uh, was um, uh, that uh, that the Islamic, um, the main Islamic Mediterranean powers, would t be too much on the rise. Um, from from the west here, uh, unfortunately, the map doesn't show that. But uh, you know, here in the west, you have Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and uh, in, the, in this very moment, in the 12th century, um, there was um, a restraining of the um, of the Islamic Spain through the, in, the injection into the Iberian Peninsula of the um, the people uh, of the um, the the Berber dynasty that they came from Morocco and or mm, at least around there of the Almohads. Mm -hmm who uh, from Africa uh, entered Spain and conquered uh, Granada in 1153, Algarve and the Balearic Islands in 1154. Uh, and, uh, and this would be a, a bit of a problem because, you know, if you have especially these protectorates here uh, in North Africa, you know, these were lands who didn't look favorably, obviously, at external powers independently from their own religion, but having a big power in Spain that um, that that is Islamic and then can you know maybe play at your own interest you know it's 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 a thing and especially Tunisia had a, and and Sicily itself before the Norman conquest had a had a very strong influence from the Caliphate of Cordova in in Spain um, so the the, the Almohads just like the Almoravids would would be a sort of uh, you know they would die out uh, quite. Uh, quite quickly because uh, you know the caliphate had collapsed as a state and these Berbers were semi-nomads who you know basically had this uh, tribal rush towards Spain but would, would die out and not manage to, to build anything consistent there but the Normans obviously didn't know that uh, as soon as they arrived in, in, in the 12th century so it was a problem and obviously these areas of Tunisia and Libya could look favorably at a Muslim power in the West helping them to regain uh, political autonomy from from the the, the Sicolo Normans uh, in here uh, in the north. Uh, but probably another major 
problem that that wasn't much of a naval one, but it's something that that affected the the terrestrial power that the Normans had in the Near East was the um, the rise of of the uh, Sultan of Egypt uh, in Arab called Salah had Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, who ruled from 1171 to 1193, better known as the Saladin, this great figure of the Muslim world, was also quite much um, positively accepted in, in Western uh, literary tradition as a very powerful uh, lord. He was definitely a great commander and he had a huge power, a brilliant man indeed, uh, in politics and warfare. Um, um, that, uh, however, obviously was an enemy of, of the Crusaders, uh, in fact, and, um, and that consolidated um, a big power, um, especially through the conquest of this very vast territory that stretched from uh, southern Arabia to Syria and to um, the high Mesopotamian uh, valley. Uh, which he achieved between 1173 and 1185, and that had an apex, telling the truth, um, with the uh, against uh, through the weakening of the uh, Christian Crusader states by conquering Aleppo in Syria in 1183, um, and especially the the very heavy blow for the Crusaders, uh, Jerusalem itself in 1187 after the Battle of Aten. Um, and, and this was a very, very heavy blow because the Kingdom of Jerusalem had been the major power uh, in the crusading, um, in the crus Crusaders' lands. So the main power at that point with Aleppo conquered. Aleppo here it's cut in, in the picture, but uh, you can read here Ale, close to Antioch. Well, th it's that close that <laughs> the Saladin arrived to Antioch, so these Norman Norman and Clap. So, um, uh, the, 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 it was evident for the Norman uh, uh, that the, the, the next uh, bulwark against the Muslim uh, uh, offense would, would, would be um, on their shoulders in the Near East. Uh, and that was uh, quite, a, quite of a problem. Uh, telling the truth, Egypt, um, However, as I was saying before, was never a naval power. The, the Saladin armed a fleet, especially to harass the, the Kingdom of Jerusalem's um, um, supply lines along the coast, especially with uh, the port of Jaffa. And he made up, he set up this fleet and fought with against the, the Italian um, galleys that instead protected Jerusalem. But when he conquered Jerusalem by land, you know, it was, you know, the, the, the way was open by land. So did, to, for the other Crusader states, so there was basically no need to to harass um, to harass um, you know the, the coasts because you know he could wage war quite easily uh, from you know by besieging these other minor relatively minor cities by land and they didn't ha he didn't have to, to to spend for a fleet in order to weaken the economical um, resources uh, like it had happened in in Jerusalem to an extent so the um, let's say that uh, you know the the, the, uh, the Egyptian expansion at this point was a big deal by by sea and by the way, this is a moment in which the Europeans are really on the rise. So the major threats eventually for the Kingdom of Sicily would come from elsewhere. And in fact, as we will be seeing, the major problems really came from the two empires, from the Byzantine Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so uh, from one side, you had in the Byzantine Empire the, the, the Emperor Emmanuel Comnenus, who basically had brought the Byzantine Empire to its peak after, you know, um, more than half a millennia. And that um, he was a very smart uh, emperor. He, he basically understood that, uh, you know, he had to emulate the Westerners in order to to compete with them. Uh, incidentally, there were a lot of Norman mercenaries into the Byzantine armies under him. Um, he favored the emigration of many uh, secular Normans into the, the empire, and uh, he he showed this munificence by essentially weakening the um, 
the fealty, the loyalty of the local Norman barons in the same kingdom of Sicily, which was a very, very, very strong move. Um, and, and the empire at, at, at that time hadn't forgotten the Italian uh, dominions that belonged to them. Essentially, the Byzantines wanted to recover the whole southern Italy and therefore to knock out the Normans and to rejoin with Rome and recomposing the schism etc. From the other side instead you had another very big figure of these times, the German Emperor Frederick I, known as Barbarossa, which is the Italian name Red Bird, Rotbard in German, which means the same. Um, who uh, instead uh, at that time was essentially supporting the papacy against uh, the Normans. Now the relationship between papacy and the Normans had always been a bit of a, you know, sort of Freudian one <laughs> in many ways because uh, the Normans had always been um, quite aggressive towards the Pope, especially initially speaking. He, they, they even managed to, to defeat him in battle and capturing him at a point. But uh, the popes from Rome, at a, spo a certain point, decided that they could essentially tie the Normans to 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 the to the Church of Rome by entrusting this at uh, Old Southern Italy um, as a fief that the Normans had to rule in their name. As a matter of fact, uh, the Normans were in fact in in, uh, in in Southern Italy as vassals of the Pope. And this thing would remain till the very end, even before the Italian unification. The kingdom, kingdom of, the, uh, of the two Sicilies still r reminded this, you know, they were obviously quite faithful for, towards the Pope for, 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 you know, contextual reasons, but uh, the, there still was this idea of this privileged um, uh, relation that dated back, in fact, to the Norman, um, um, to the Norman times, and Frederick um, at, uh, at that point, however, you know, the Normans obviously always looked theoretically at the idea of expanding somewhere. The, and that would be that was basically the standard of any power at that point. Doesn't matter if you were Normans and you had to invade the Pope or it was anywhere else. And at that point, for, for reasons that we can't. Uh, focus because it's already a very long video like it is um, um, the um, the the Normans were were a threat for for papal Rome and so um, the the German Emperor Frederick the first had um, uh, uh, in order to 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 gain an imperial crown by the po um, Pope's hands had accepted uh, um, with the Treaty of Constance of 1153 to uh, make uh, an expedition in Italy in, in uh, anti-Norman function among among the other things, uh, and, um, and William William the First um, of of Sicily at the time uh, understood that uh, you know the uh, the situation was pretty dire because uh, the, the 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 same survival of the kingdom between uh, east and west seemed. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty difficult to 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 hold for long. So um, he um, um, he decided to abandon for a moment the Mediterranean ambition. So that tells you how you know in, the the, the Sicil Normans were quite you know rational, pragmatic, and capable of switching strategical scenario and thinking strategically, um, and to 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 concentrate strength not on sea but on on land in Italy um and um and and the, he he basically fought even against the Byzantines by gaining a series of military victories that brought um um by 1158 to the um to a peace treaty of 30 years with the empire of the east so that meant securing you know uh, the uh, you know the the uh, the Norman domains of uh, the Italian southern uh, Ita of southern Italy from the uh, the Byzantine threat that was achieved uh, at a very high cost. Telling the truth, because Byzantines had managed to invade Italy. That's an, a beautiful chapter. We'll surely make a video in detail about that expedition because it was something incredible. The Byzantines were about to wipe out Normans. A uh, history have, would have changed radically in many ways. 
um, but the Normans were quite clever. They they displayed uh, um, you know great strategical thinking. They 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 waged war against the Byzantine. They they besieged them into in, into the 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 Byzantine uh, in the Italian avantposts that they had landed in by land and sea. So that tells you how you know the the how important the combination of having a feudal terrestrial power and naval power. Um, and that was a brilliant move, and the Normans were able to kick the Byzantines ass um, pretty, 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 um, pretty hard. Um, and uh, that was a very heavy blow for the Byzantine Empire. And 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 and, and I'm sorry for Emmanuel Comnenus, because he was a freaking good emperor as well. Uh, but it's not the reason why eventually the the, the empire would have fallen eventually against the Crusaders. Um, Surely didn't good uh, didn't do any good, <laughs> and uh, and relatively to Frederick the um, uh, William managed to to de to deprive the German emperor of uh, the the papal um, um, support by you know um, deciding after essentially one century of, of difficult relationship with the Pope to make a new alliance with Rome. So here there they played even more cleverly uh, cleverly uh, by um uh with diplomatical skills. And that's why in fact in 1156 at Benevent that was a papal uh, uh, that would remain uh, would remain a papal enclave to in into the Norman lands because it, it's where uh, Benevent was um uh, the, one of the capitals of the, uh, uh, I mean, it was the capital of one of the Longbird uh, princedoms in southern Italy. And at the point when Normans conquered southern Italy, uh, this was like the last Avon post, and they, uh, the Longbirds preferred to to entrust themselves to the Pope, and then to the Longbirds. So basically, the Normans kept this uh, enclave of Benevent as papal domains within uh, their um, peninsular domains. And and it's, it's in fact no surprise that it's in in this place in 1156 that William um, uh, made a uh, swore, um, swore a, an oath of allegiance to Pope Adrian IV by um, uh, obtaining an, a new uh, investiture because that was, as I was saying before, what Normans originally had had in order to rule on, on, on the south and at that point the, the situation had changed because there were, there were rivalries but now this is reconfirmed and uh, and at the same time he um, uh, he was confirmed the apostolic legacy in, into um, into the south so uh, William at this point he was the clever guy um, he um he strengthened um greatly the, the Norman monarchy um and consolidated this um relationship between papacy and Sicily that uh that would have served uh very well to, to avoid especially the the uh the German uh injurance in, into southern Italy. Um uh for for a certain time. And on the internal front however Rebellions continued. Uh, the aristocracy arose in 1160 uh, to 1161, and uh, and that rebellion was uh, managed with extreme violence. Normans could really you know how to use an iron fist. To to the guys who had opened the gates to Byzantines in Apulia during the invasion of of Emmanuel Comnenus, uh, they they raised. Uh, um, uh, Bari to the ground. Bari, the city of Bari was an extremely powerful city, and also one with a great Byzantine tradition. They raised to the ground everything, I think except the cathedral or something like that. You know, it was a very hard, very you know, big show of violence that was a, a very cleverly thought one because it was a very, uh, it was a deterrent, a uh, very strong deterrent that really made, that really showed what what the the oath will were capable of against the uh, the traitors. Uh, but uh, you know, at the same time, the 12th century, with well, the end of the 12th century, is also the the, the same end of the 
of the um, of the Oldville dynasty in Sicily. Um, there was a marriage between uh, William II, um, uh, I mean wanted by William II, of um, his uh, own Constance, uh, his father's uh, sister, uh, with Henry of Swabia, the son of Frederick I, uh, who was at that time, um, you know, uh, heir to the imperial tr uh, tr um, throne uh, of, of the Holy Roman Empire. And, um, and and the point is that William II died in 1189 without heirs, uh, or at least not without with direct heirs, and uh, the crown passed to Constance and uh, through her uh, as a wife of, of Henry the sixth of the Holy Roman Empire to the Swabians, and that's how basically the Swabian dynasty began. Then a series of other problems begin because Henry the uh, dies early, and um, you know, and Frederick the second son is still a minor, and everything you know. But that belongs to the 13th century mostly, and uh, that's another story. For for today, I just wanted to you know to show how many troubles. And this is and this was a really simplified one. I've been talking for uh, an hour and ten minutes, my God. Um, but it was an extremely concise, um, you know, um, picture of all the problems that ruling uh, the uh, the Sicilian Norman kingdoms uh, actually was, and and thinking that the Sicilian Norman kingdom was one of the most advanced, or if uh, at, at this time, telling the truth, the most advanced in Europe, definitely. Um, and um, and even the most one of the most powerful militarily at least on paper was the strongest um, uh, kingdom. Uh, so uh, w with very great advantages given by the the geographical location and uh, interior and you know local resources and political setting, but but it still you know you saw how you know it was about to be wiped out uh, in a blink of an eye um, and how many threats and how many factors had to intervene uh, in order to you know to, to pursue a policy in here which I repeat here it's been brutally concise you know it was something like ex 100 times more complicated according to the old various things happening all over Europe um, and I made it really too simple but I still hope it, it helped some way. So I thank you very much for listening if you <laughs> managed to arrive to the end um, and um, uh, I as always you know uh, if you like this video I uh, uh, it, it would be a very good thing to share it if you like my contents that's really the best you can do for me or otherwise you can just leave a like or a dislike why not I deserve dislikes as well um, and uh, and subscribe to my channel if you are uh, interested in receiving further content. So as always, I thank you once again for uh, for uh, for the attention, for listening. Uh, I wish you a very nice time, and see you next time. Bye.